Good morning and a warm welcome again to Abbey at Home. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the saying birds of a feather flock together. Certainly if you look outside the window at the back of the manse uh, there are plenty of sparrows flocking together, uh, a few magpies, um, a few blackbirds as well and even though they're not birds we actually have two squirrels and they're all flocking around the bird feeder and the nuts that are there. We're going to be looking today at the whole thing of who keeps company with whom and what do we uh, understand by that? What do we make of people who hang around and keep company with certain other kinds of people? This is something that Jesus was recognised for and ultimately it was something he died for. So as we set our hearts and our minds to the scriptures and to the living word, even Jesus Christ himself, we want to attend to the people with whom he kept company and the implications of that for our lives. Worship with us as we worship God. Salvation, perfect 
Valentine's Day and uh, it would be remiss of us not to at least give some indication of it. The great thing is that our children have given us some wonderful artwork to celebrate uh, not so much even St Valentine's Day as the God of love and the love that brings us together as a family, as a people of God, as people bound together in love. So enjoy their pictures, their words and their thoughts and imaginations. And the first one is from Lee. There's these wonderful uh, hearts that are surrounding, uh, I suppose, the great poem uh, from Paul from 1 Corinthians 13, all about love. And she's written it all out, every single one of it. Well done, Lee. Our next picture is from Oscar. And Oscar seems to have a dragon for us, and the poor old dragon is a broken heart. So I don't know if that is uh, the dragon's, or is it a dinosaur maybe? A broken heart, or they've just got very hungry for love. A picture from his brother, and this is from James. And James really enjoys his yellow pen, which is always a nice happy colour to include, isn't it? And then full of hearts behind, and a couple of hearts, it seems, sticking out his ears. This heart was made by all the city family. And they really love their pink, every tone of pink you could imagine. And if you look carefully there at the bottom, another reading this time from uh, a letter from Peter, which encourages us all to keep on loving one another. This heart was made by Isabel and she sent it in to all the people on the WhatsApp group. I love the fact that she's included all those names, so every single one of us is appearing there from the WhatsApp group and we're all connected by love and surrounded by love. And there are a few very interesting details as well to take note of. This heart with all the writing on is um, from the Gormans. And they've been extremely busy with their words. You can see love and hugs. And in other words as well, listen. And uh, they're encouraging us to uh, take all of those things in because love is something we act upon and not just something that we talk about. These hearts were made by Daniel. Do you know, Daniel, what I really love about this uh, picture is the fact that um, throughout this service, I'll be talking about the company we keep. And uh, you have a company of people together in worship and held in love and holding love up for other people to join. Uh, so that's a particularly apt one for today. We have a picture here from Caesar. And uh, Caesar has all of his family uh, in the heart, heart there, and uh, I bet there's a great deal of love around them. And Jesus, who is throwing out his love to them, and maybe also going to embrace them in his love. And another picture from his sister, this is from Marta. Marta, you have really gone to town on this one. I love the idea that somehow or another our, our heart love is going up like a balloon into the sky and a lovely smiley sunny day it is too uh, for love to be shared from us to other people. And from Rene. Well, it looks as if the whole family have been surrounded by love here. They all appear again in the heart. And then, of course, the cross that's beside it, which is the demonstration of God's great love for us and the way in which he brings us into his love. I think you'll agree that we have got some talented artists within our little family of God. Uh, they have a marvellous notion of what it is to love and to be loved. And uh, we look forward to the days and the weeks and indeed the years that lie ahead where they and we grow in that love of God through Jesus Christ. Humans have a wonderful capacity for love, for selflessness for sacrifice, for thoughtfulness, for care, in big demonstrations, in small ways no one else sees. The last year has seen love in action like no other. 
We see what love looks like all around us. But where does it come from? Why do we love at all? The Bible says we love because God first loved us. It all starts with God. This is where love comes from. This is why we love. We have a God who isn't just loving, but who is love. And he gives only the best. When God passed love down to us, it didn't come as a hug, or a home-cooked meal, or a Skype call, loving as those things are. It came as his son. Jesus was born as a baby. He lived for 33 years in a broken, messy, confused world. He saw our sin and suffering. And then he died for us, in our place, restoring our relationship with God. Humans do have a wonderful capacity for love. But we're not lovely all the time. We know that. We aren't thoughtful always. We aren't self-sacrificial always. We fail at the small demonstrations of love, let alone the big ones. God's love was the biggest demonstration ever. God's love outlasts human love. God's love came for when human love fails and makes mistakes and isn't enough. This Valentine's Day, let's celebrate the biggest, greatest, strongest love story that is God's love for an unlovely people. The God who loved us first. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Spid Olabona and today I'll be taking the reading from Mark chapter 15, verse 21 to 28, the crucifixion of Jesus. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice on the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, He was counted among those who were rebels. Thank you. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And so the Lord makes his life an offering for sin. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And my death he 
to cast your mind back a year or more but try to recall the sort of people that you kept company with people that you rather liked being seen with maybe it was because you shared an interest with them or they just happened to share your sense of humor maybe they're your own age they may be younger or older it might be some common cause that you have together, but you like not only to be with them, but you like to be seen being with them. Maybe they're just known for being very intelligent or very capable, very gifted. Maybe they have a reputation for being cool and we all want to be in the in crowd. Even those of us who aren't in the in crowd uh, harbour dreams of one day being in the in crowd. Once you've got those people in your mind, ask yourself this question. Why do I want to be seen with those people? Why do I want to be in their company? Is it because... If they are successful, I too might be successful, or at least have a reputation for it. Might it be that they will give me a better look or feel about myself than otherwise I might have? You see, very often we are known by the company that we keep. And the company that we keep says a lot about the aspirations that we have. It's not just an indication of who we are, 
it's an indication of who we want to become. And that's why some people do make it their business of hanging around the rich and famous in the hope that they too may become rich and famous. It's why some people distance themselves from family and friends with whom they grew up because they fear that somehow that might just make them look bad. Somehow or another it doesn't fit with the kind of person that they want to become known for. I remember some years ago uh, reading Hitler's Mein Kampf, My Struggle, the story about himself that he wanted everybody to hear and to know. And the thing that struck me most about that book was the number of times that we were sent down to the footnotes to find out that, in fact, something else was actually true and not what Hitler had chosen to put in the text. We have to go to the footnotes of Mark's Gospel in order to discover a true fact about Jesus and about his ambitions. Now, it's not because the main body of the text is telling lies. And actually, it's really rather more mundane than that. It's simply that Bible scholars aren't quite sure at this juncture whether they should put it into that part uh, of the text or perhaps somewhere else. When we read the Gospels as a whole, it becomes very clear that Jesus doesn't care very much about the people with whom he keeps company. It doesn't matter whether it makes him look good, bad or indifferent. For him, that'll be quite beside the point. And there, in the footnote regarding Mark chapter 15, verse 28, we read these words. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, he was reckoned with the transgressors. Quoting a bit from Isaiah. It is a note about the company that Jesus keeps. Now, you'd have to say that it doesn't sound like the kind of company you might choose to keep who wants to be numbered amongst the transgressors, whatever exactly that means. He seems to be hanging out with the wrong sort of people. This can't be a good thing. It can't end well. But something even more precise and more technical is at play here. It is fairly clear from the formula of the quotation that Jesus has a particular reason for keeping the company that he does keep. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says he has to keep this kind of company or appear to in order to fulfill what scripture had already laid down for him. The company he keeps is by design, according to scripture. It is by choice, according to vocation. Well, what do I mean by all of that? Isaiah describes the appearance, identity and vocation of a rather obscure character known simply as the servant or the suffering servant. Is the servant a, a collective noun for the whole people of Israel? Well, yes, up to a point. For some reason, Israel was called by God to suffer disgracefully the treatment that would be meted out to them at the hands of the pagan nations. Uh, they would do this as a consequence of their own disobedience, their own sin, and also as a consequence of the sin of the nations in their actions against them. 
Now, within this strange vocation, Israel, naturally enough, would rather hang out with different people, the right sort of people, the rich, the powerful, the victorious. They would prefer to worship the way the other nations worship, to dress the way the other nations dress, to eat the kinds of food that other nations eat, and to conduct themselves generally in the way that everybody else seems to be allowed to conduct themselves. They would prefer that. The irony of them choosing that way of living and that crowd to keep, rather than to fulfil the vocation of the suffering servant, is rather ironically that they end up suffering. According to the footnote, along comes an individual, still an Israelite, who is willing to take on the role of the vocation of the suffering servant. Not only does he hang around with the wrong kind of people, he actually chooses to be identified with them, to be numbered or reckoned with the transgressors. He does what Israel would not or could not do. He bears the full weight of human idolatry and hostility. As the representative of Israel and indeed of all humanity, he draws all of this from us. He takes it upon himself, he absorbs it, and he frees us from it. The suffering servant, of course, is Jesus. This is how he rescues and restores you so that you can keep company with God. Isn't that incredible? That God should be so determined to hang out with you that he is prepared to go to these lengths in order to bring that about. That he is prepared to become one of us, to suffer as us, to suffer for us, in order to enable us to share in his company. That is what you are invited to think about, to believe and to embrace. I wonder if you've done that yet. And if you are thinking about the implications of Jesus, the suffering servant vocation, all on your behalf, think about this also. He was numbered with, reckoned with, identified with transgressors. As we mentioned last week, it wasn't your bog standard thief that Jesus literally hung out with on the cross. Crucifixion was the penalty paid by revolutionaries, by radicals, by political activists. When the Roman authorities, egged on by the Jewish establishment, nailed Jesus to the cross and placed there the charge sheet, King of the Jews, they were sending out a very public and very clear message. We're in charge here. Don't you dare forget it. And don't you dare try to resist it. It's at this point that had we been there and had we had the guts for it, we might have sided with Jesus. Uh, we might have said, don't be stupid, he's no revolutionary. He's a peaceful man. He hugged babies. He healed women. He went down the pub with the lads and had a pint or two. He's certainly not a revolutionary. You've got him all wrong. And in a way, of course, his enemies had got him wrong. But so too had his friends. And that much is evident from a passage in Luke's Gospel, which quotes the same text from Isaiah, albeit at a somewhat different part of 
the last week of Jesus' life. And beware, by the way, this is an uncomfortable and awkward text for us. Here it is. Jesus asks, When I sent you out with no purse or bag or sandal, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. He said to them, But now let him who has a purse take it, and likewise a bag. And let him who has, a, has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he was reckoned with transgressors. For what is written about me must be fulfilled. And they, his disciples, said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. What do you make of that? It sounds as if Jesus is a revolutionary after all, calling his disciples to arm themselves and take on the Romans in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And when the soldiers come to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, one of those two swords is indeed drawn and does indeed draw blood. But Jesus very quickly stops the action. He heals the severed ear and he surrenders himself with barely a skirmish. The disciples, it seems, misunderstood. You see, it is by suffering and absorbing violence, not by inflicting it, that Jesus will fulfil his role as the suffering servant. Nevertheless, Jesus will die the death of a transgressor. And there's a final clue in the context of Luke's story. You see, when Jesus rallied his disciples to take up arms, he was responding to a discussion about who was the greatest among them. Their ambitions were all wrong. Worldly ambition is one at the point of a sword. Armed revolutions succeed in overthrowing dictators only to replace them with another dictator. Jesus is mounting a revolution, all right, but it is a revolution of love. It does not take life from others, it lays down its life for others. It does not lord it over other people, it serves other people. As Paul reminds the Philippians, Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being formed in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. It was not at all obvious to friend or foe that this was God as the suffering servant, turning things around, putting the world to rights. To those looking on, he was just another blood-soaked revolutionary whose death demonstrated another failed attempt at freedom. But the revolution of love met all the criteria described for it in Isaiah. And it succeeds. So, if you want to keep company with Jesus, you're going to have to become like him, a suffering servant. If you want to be the greatest, you're going to have to become the least of all. Because the truth is, you will be known by the company you keep. Yes.
God of love, God of grace, God who gives us all good things, thank you for our hearts. Things that through these hearts we feel deeply, know fully, and sense eternity. These hearts you gave, these hearts where you dwell, help us to guard them, guide them, and protect them. You live in our hearts, you live in the deepest parts of our feelings. Guide us through them, help us to make sense of them, and to fulfill them in your way. We pray through the name of the one who loves us most, Jesus Christ, lover of our soul. Amen. My Lord, who rendered his life for us, what have you done for me? My Lord, who rendered his life for us, what have you done for me? He died on the cross for you and me. He gave his life for all of us. He died on the cross for you and me. 
We ask a blessing, Lord, on all healthcare workers, from cleaners to consultants. We ask for strength and gentleness, strength for the demands of each day, and gentleness towards all with whom they have contact. We pray particularly for those people known to us. Grant them wisdom, Lord, in all their dealings, and the attitude of servants called to serve the sick. May they do so with compassion and a thankful spirit. Work through them, Lord, to bring healing and wholeness. Amen. He died on the cross for you and me. He gave his life for all of us. He died on the cross for you and me. What have you done for him? My Lord, who rendered his life for us. What have you done for him? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So we've discovered that Jesus kept company with transgressors. Indeed, he was identified with them. And yet, the implications of all of that is that he fulfilled the role of the suffering servant. And by that, he launched his revolution of love. We're called to be part of that revolution of love, to lay ourselves down as his suffering servants, to love those by giving our lives for them, as he has done for us. We'll need his strength, we'll need his wisdom, and we'll need his example in order to fulfil our role. May we pray together. Lord, help us to be your servants. Help us to be formed into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Enable us to play our part in your revolution of love so that many more may keep company with you and through you to keep company with God. Joy is flowing like
Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and remain with us always. Amen.